Time now to get the latest trends in dive retailing, travel, and training with Level Up, the podcast of Scuba Diving Industry Magazine. Now, here's your host, Scuba Radio's Greg the Dive Master. That is me. Welcome to uh, the latest edition of the Level Up podcast. Uh, I am joined by some diving dignitaries in the industry, and uh, we got a fully loaded show for you today uh, as we do this podcast in adjacent with Scuba Diving Industry Magazine, my buddy Willie Klein with, with me. Willie, how are you? Are you ready for this again? I am so ready, so ready. So this this uh, this issue was even better than the last. I keep saying that every month, but it was truly, really amazing. Well, I, I don't know if it's going to be better, but it's definitely going to be uh, more out there because we're streaming live on Facebook Live and YouTube uh, as we do this. So it's live without a net uh, this time around as well. So, you know, all, all our flaws are going to be exposed. So thank goodness <laughs> yeah, but- we... We have some good uh, folks in the industry to kind of, you know, uh, offset my shenanigans. Okay. Well, no, and we we are honored with the presence of the dive god himself yes. today. We got Neil Watson. Neil, how are yeah. you, buddy? Well, everybody everybody should be comfortable no matter what they do. I'll upstage you throw something wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, got, we got the dive god looking over us, uh, <laughs> literally and figuratively, and then we're, we're blessed to have him. Uh, but, man, uh, we, we got a... Uh, a bunch of folks that we got to talk to before we get into, you know, featuring some of the uh, writers from Scuba Diving Industry Magazine, this uh, latest issue. We got to bring Britton on. He's kind of the, you know, he's like uh, Willie's main guy. Uh, Willie takes all the credit. Uh, Britton does all the work. Yeah, so, he sure does. So, uh, Britton, uh, you know, give us the latest. Uh, you know, Dima's just around the corner. We're a little over a month away. And, uh, you know, what's been going on with the magazine and everything else of what you've been up to? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've got a lot of really great things coming, but uh, we're super excited for DEMA. Uh, we're just about 47 days away now, I believe. Um, and October's issue is shaping up to be our biggest issue yet. Um, it's packed with all things DEMA. Uh, it's going to be available on the show floor in booth 8075. Um, and we'll even have copies on the lobby floor for all the attendees, complete with an expanded exhibitor and seminar list. Well, so you're going to be seeing me uh, more often than not. You just made yes, a sir. huge mistake, my friend. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, and by the way, too, there's still also time to get an add-in before the uh, 20th of October deadline. So if there is anyone out there who wants to grab some prime visibility during the show, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm all ears and I'd well, love to chat. There you go. That sounds like a great opportunity. And uh, well, any shout outs you want to give before we get started today? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, totally. There's uh, all the advertisers that have come on board so far. I mean, you guys are really the reason that Scuba Diving Industry Magazine can reach who we reach uh, all over the globe and and help the businesses that we've been able to uh, help grow. And I I also want to take a second to just thank our our awesome, incredible writers for keeping the conversations going between dive pros and the retail, travel, manufacturing, and training uh, businesses. It's it's really, really inspiring to get to be a part of this. And I'm learning so much from both the vets and, um, you know, the newer generation as well. So it's been a it's been a blessing. Yeah. Well, speaking of the new generation, you got some personal news that you're yes, uh, ready to share. What is it? Yes, sir. Well, I recently um, uh, pretty excited to uh, uh, announce that I've been recently nominated for the DEMA Wave Makers Award. Sweet. Um, which recognizes young professionals in the industry for less than five years, I believe. Um, but voting does start soon. So if you are a DEMA member, I would really, really appreciate your support. Uh, the winner will be announced at the DEMA member breakfast uh, on November 20th. But that's all I got, Greg. Yeah. Well, Back that's up. all. That's kind of a big deal, man. Congrats. A little bit, a little bit. Excited yeah. for it. So, yeah. And you. wave makers are basically, uh, you know, the next generation, the new folks coming into the dive industry that we want to shine a spotlight on and and britain has been doing some good work in that uh, regard so uh, i think it'll be well deserved when you win i'm just thank you much (laughs) we'll leave it at that right okay so uh let's talk about uh, level up you know this is the podcast for scuba diving industry magazine and we've been doing this uh you know a few months now and it's hopefully getting better i don't know if it is or not but man do we have some great guests 
uh, on every uh, every month. And uh, this week uh, we got Willie Klein. We got the dive god to help manage things, and of course Britton. So uh, you know we got that uh, base covered. Our, our first guest is who? Willie. Who do we want to go to well, first? Well, do you realize, Greg, that now you actually have mermen? What? Yeah, instead of mermaids on this show, you have mermen. You got Britain, you got yeah. me, and you got Neil. We're oh. like your mermen. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, your your view of uh, mermen and mine might be slightly different because I was very well, hesitant I, on how I, to proceed. <laughs> I, I had some cocktails and uh, okay, and Greg put me that's in a usually where it, yeah, I yep. work well. that's how it starts <laughs> and yeah. usually how it okay. ends. So our first, uh, our first amazing contributor is someone that I have such an amazing respect for. Um, her experiences, she has more, learned more, and knows more about how to help businesses in this industry than I think uh, I've ever in my life could acquire. Uh, Catherine comes from us from the Azores Islands in Portugal, and she is coming to the show next month. I or in November. I'm making a commercial for her. Go see her. She's got some great advice for you if you're a business owner. So I'm going to mm -hmm. pass it over to. You, Greg, and Catherine. Okay. Well, Catherine. Hey, everybody. So uh, page 28 is the latest issue of Dive Industry uh, uh, Dive Industry Magazine. And your article is, uh, you know, how to grow your business. So I hear you're offering some seminars at DEMA. What are they going to be about? Yeah, actually, I am absolutely thrilled to be a DEMA featured session uh, speaker this year. Um, I've been attending, well, I've been in the industry for 40 plus years now, and I've probably gone to over 30 demos in person. And this is my first time as a featured speaker. So I'm both excited and really humbled to have that opportunity. And they actually are going to let me do this twice, um, <laughs> which I think is, I, I hope I don't screw up the first one. Um, but at any rate, I'm doing two session tracks on marketing. And uh, we have a marketing 101 and a marketing 201. And they're going to build off of each other. So the, the core concept is connect, profit, repeat. Because all of us are in some way an expert in the scuba diving industry, but we might not be experts at business. And that's a great many of us. Like when I first owned my own dive center, I just started a dive center because I loved diving and I had an opportunity. I didn't have an MBA and I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I, I knew how to teach scuba, but I didn't know how to be really successful as a business person. And fast forward 40 plus years, now I know. Now I know how to do all that. And I want to share it with the people in the room at DEMA. We're social creatures. We crave connection. Scuba diving instructors are really good at making connections, but we often miss the opportunity to create a cash flow connection that makes our customers feel seen and heard and loved so that they feel like we're like the coolest place to put their money and they keep doing that. So we're going to do some neuroscience hacks, which that means brain, Greg, the, uh, what happens in your brain when you're thinking. Thanks and for clarifying that for me. I just wanted you to stay with <laughs> me because, you know, I'm here to teach and share. Big words. Um, but we, yeah, big words, big words. So it's going to be, uh, I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but what's going to happen in the room is a collaborative effort of people that are already experts at some of the things in the industry sharing with each other on ways that we can connect, profit, repeat. That's what we're doing. I love it. And I'm, I've, I well, hope everyone will come and join me. Well, they should. I Because I, I got to say, if you just have the opportunity to hang around Catherine for any amount of time, you'll just see how bright of a spirit she is. She is so friendly, one of the nicest people Aww. you could ever meet in the dive industry. And to boot, she's a she's a previous hand model. You have to ask plus, her about her hand she, hand modeling she, career back in the she day. She told me that if she sees you in the bar, she'll buy you a drink. So what? there's oh. that too. You know, actually, I might do that, but I, it's a great opportunity for me to tell you that I'll be doing all sorts of giveaways uh, at my little sessions. There'll be toys and games and books and all sorts of value added opportunities when you come in the room. And if you attend both sessions, you get a 
super good fortune, double bonus opportunity. Um, and I have some uh, dive retailers and also some travel providers that I think are going to come up with some amazing uh, door prizes for session attendees. So uh -huh. yeah, if and you, everybody gets a free free subscription to our magazine. That's a big deal. Absolutely. There's yeah. that. So oh, wait, it's um, free anyhow. <laughs> well, to say that I'm excited about doing this is an understatement. I am super stoked to have this platform and to be able to share. And I'm excited at what the groups that I talk to work on together and build moving forward. Well, there you go. If you send out any like uh, mailers or emails or anything like that to promote the seminar, uh, Catherine, let me just suggest that if, uh, you know, we put something on there like, look, if you don't show up, I'm going to send you a picture of Neil in a mermaid tail. But uh, ooh, there you go. Threats Negative reinforcement. Our promises. You have a sellout crowd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, I think uh, is Dan Orr next. Is that who we're going to? He sure is. Perfect. Dan Orr is so, going to talk about I, uh, I, cardiac issues. I, I have to. I have to say a little commercial here. Dan Orr recently was the keynote down in Cayman this last weekend and Saturday for the International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame uh, ceremony, and we're going to talk about that later at the end of the hour. Uh, with Patty and Amber, but uh, I just have to say he did probably one of the most amazing keynotes I've ever heard in my life on on the aging diver. So uh, with that intro, Dan, <laughs> take it away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so page seven, uh, getting to the heart of the matter. So when you gave your presentation, you put everybody in cardiac arrest in uh, Cayman. No, that didn't happen. I'm sure. No, I don't think so. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, what were you talking about there? Uh, uh, Dan, in the latest I was actually issue. talking about uh, the aging diver, but I wanted to bring it around to how the aging diver can take that next step when they decide to hang up their fins and be mentors. So it was an, an opportunity to say, you know, we get all these older people are out there diving, and then we have these people who would like to continue to contribute once they start actively, stop actively diving. So why not be a mentor and bring in more younger people into the sport? I like it. That's a good yeah. plan. Absolutely. And uh, so, so when, but when it comes to healthy uh, hearts and, and diving, how, how does that uh, come into play? And wh what are oh, you going to explain I mean, in the latest issue? Well, cardiovascular disease has always been a big problem anyway. And it's actually the probably the number one global killer anyway. And when I first came to Dan in 1991 uh, and we published the Dan Axner reports, it, it did indicate that about 20 some percent of the people who were involved in fatalities, uh, they were a result of a cardiac event. When I left Dan there in 2013, that number was well over 30%. It wasn't my fault, by the way. I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, Were it you in a, a mermaid tail, too? No, no, no. Not, okay. No. no, no. <laughs> uh, but in 2008, uh, Dan actually published a report where he analyzed 947 fatalities. And uh, the number one trigger event in those fatalities was running out of breathing gas underwater. In 2015, they analyzed another set of diving fatalities, and the number one trigger event had changed from running out of breathing gas to underlying health issues. And so that will give you an indication of how prominent cardiac disease is in active diving population. And it's a real serious problem. And um, what we need to do and what I talk about in the article, of course, is to make sure that uh, you have an annual physical if you're over the age of 45 or probably not a bad idea to have it even younger. Uh, but periodically you have a cardiac evaluation along with it. I actually just went through mine this past year to make sure everything was working and everything luckily is working well. So I want to make sure that I continue to die for a long time. We need to reduce the number of people uh, who end up dying of cardiac related issues uh, while they're diving. So true. And this hits a little too close to home for me. Oh, yeah. August 2016, I had a one-way bypass, and it was just a, a routine checkup kind of thing that caught it. Otherwise, yeah. I was uh, heading off to the Maldives, and something terrible could have happened. So, yeah. you know, I, I want to reiterate that one a little bit. And yeah, I was I, just talking to a friend of mine the other day who's a uh, retired Navy SEAL, and he was doing a bike ride. Uh, got in the last five miles of his bike ride, started feeling kind of bad, and all of a sudden he started having some discomfort in his left arm and uh, and got back home, and he had a cardiac event uh, there in his house. Mm, yeah, it's not good. It can happen to anyone. It's happened Damn. to me. They fixed me up, and I'm good to go, and I'm diving, and everything's fine. But, but you got to pay attention uh, to your heart health. There's no question yeah. about it. Good stuff. As always, Dan. 
All right. Uh, Thanks, up Dan. next, uh, Gil, I believe, is up on the docket from uh, Diving Industry Magazine, uh, page 11. AI enters diving. Uh-oh, this sounds scary. Gil, what can you tell us? Hey, everyone. Yeah, so uh, as William has told you in the past, my career has been as an advertising copywriter. And over the last few years, as I phase out of that and more into scuba writing, travel writing, uh, several of my clients just in the last few years have said, are you using AI to create content? And I said, no, I have not, because I, I'm lucky enough to be prolific and always have too many good ideas. And, and I don't want to rely on a computer to do something I have done my whole career. And, but as an experiment, I pitched to, to Willie. I said, you know, why don't we write an article where we write part of it using AI to write? And I gave it specific information in chat GBT. I typed in, write a humorous blog in the style of Gilzheimer about honeymooning in Maui with my wife and snorkeling near humpback whales. And so I did that. And in 16 seconds, it spit out a story that was fairly good but it didn't have any of my personal experiences, didn't have my wife's name, didn't say what, uh, where we were staying, what the name of the catamaran was, anything like that. And then I generated a photo, I'm gonna share this with you. What's wrong with this picture, folks? Hmm. <laughs> a lot of extra uh, fins there. Yeah, yeah. It's, no fluke. it's got three flukes. <laughs> so one thing of caution about AI is that you have to double check it. I mean, and and so and then I wrote the second part of the article, which which went back to an article I wrote in 1993 for Adventure Journal, where my wife and I did snorkel near humpbacks. And the article began with the words, "Well, I'm well on our honeymoon. My wife and I fell in love with another man, and we're not even swingers. He was a big fella, 45 tons, etc." It's on page 12 of my story. <laughs> so I had that 400 word story, and then. I spent the last part of the article interviewing a industry experts like Jessica and like Jeff and uh, someone at DEMA and a few other places. And four of the five are using AI, but they're using it cautiously. They're, they're testing the waters, they're test driving it. They're not relying on it solely, but they're using it for things like email subject lines and to animate a diver from a still image in an email to an animated image. and for, for blog ideas and so on, but they're all testing the waters. And the point is, AI is a great tool, but use it cautiously because you have to double check it. Uh, it has no personal experience from your point of view, et cetera. So that's how I feel about AI. Okay. Well, but, I, I think that you know, makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah. What's really cool is that Neil's not even here. That's a deep fake of Neil. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> that's AI Neil. Right, digital. He mail. disappeared. See, I told you. There you go. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, he might still be there. It could just be a camera angle issue. <laughs> we don't know yet. But uh, yeah, AI. I, you know, I use it quite a bit myself. In in, in you know, like trying to come drafting up uh, creative ideas for scuba right. radio. But yeah, if you rely on it too much, or like you you just do a search on Greg the Dive Master on scuba radio and Chat GPT, God help you. <laughs> I've won so many more awards that I didn't even know existed. It's uh, pretty remarkable. It, it does a good uh, job lying even better than I. So yeah. you got to take one it with more a, thing. Yes, Gil. Sorry, one more thing about AI. Mm -hmm. If you use AI and you type in specific instructions for, say, a, a blog, and someone else types in the same instructions, you're going to come out with identical content. Hmm. And that's not good. That's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, use it yeah. as a idea starter. That's how I do. Samantha right, right. Witchcraft. Yeah. Does she has a question? Maybe. She's gonna... Yeah, it's Witchcraft, but that's oh, okay. I'm sorry. I got called that in grade school all the time. I'm, I'm sure. sure. I apologize. It is Witchcraft. That's okay. Um, so, I just to jump in on the AI thing. Um, I I do a lot of writing um, for various different things and projects, and what I found AI is most useful for is an outline. So I will literally give it the prompt: write me an outline about such and such a topic, being sure to logically include, and then I'll give it a list of the subjects that I think would make a good outline, and that gives it enough prompts that it usually produces a. You do have to check it. It hallucinates. But 
once you've checked that outline, it's usually just a great way to, like you were saying, Gil, to just like jumpstart a writing project. Right, right. Use for an outline, but then do your own research and put it in your yeah. own words with your own experiences. Makes sense. Well, okay. since uh, Sam jumped in, I think, Willie, we ought to go to her next. What do you think? How about well, that? actually, no. no. She's a little later on. We're okay, going you to want go to stay to in order. All okay. the way. All We're right. going to stay in the order. Sorry. That's and the reason right. being is because <clears throat> this next uh, contributor, I was sitting down chatting with him, and he mentioned that he had, you know, I think it was on Facebook, I'd originally seen him. He had been to Korea, South Korea <clears throat> and wow. posted these amazing photos. I'm like, what the heck is going on over there? So I reached out to Carl. I said, Carl, you got to tell us because part of what the magazine hopes to accomplish is bring other cultures, other diving cultures, and and communicate it to people in the English language all around the world because our, our reach is 165 countries. So when I heard about, I saw what Carl had done and we talked about it, he has produced this amazing article. So uh, sorry for the hype intro there, Carl, but it really is spectacular. <laughs> Uh, and I can't wait for people to read it. So go ahead. Oh, well, where should I start? <laughs> well, tell us Korea. about yeah, Korean diving. Uh, well, well, it's funny. It's, it's not so much the diving so much as their approach to the dive business. And uh, Catherine hit on it in spades. They're a very, very social culture, and they know how to do it to the nth degree. Um, if you read the article, you'll see – you go to a Korean dive center, you're not just welcome. They give you stuff. They coffee is huge over there right now. And it's not, you know, junky coffee. I mean, they have major barista style uh, coffee machines in their uh, operations. Some of them actually have cafes that are like Starbucks level hmm. <clears throat> and uh, seating. They, they do a lot to get you to stay. And I with with no agenda, just hang out with us. You're just talking about in the dive shop, time. in the Korean dive shop. In, they have this. Wow. It, yeah, okay. absolutely. And uh, and in the piece, because we don't have a lot of time, I talk a lot about their uh, their approach to the purpose uh, built sites. You know, we all have heard of Deep Dive Dubai. They have three Deep Station K26 and Paradive. And I compare them to country clubs because if you go there, that's what it's like. It's a place. I can go after work, I can dive, I can hang out. They've got everything I need. It's all right there. I mean, they include the gear as part of the experience. I, all I have to do, I, you really don't even need a bathing suit if you if you change into the wetsuit in the changing room. Uh, they even have towels, and then you could eat there. So if you think what a, col a country club is to a golfer, they've created that for a diver. And in a country where they work only recently five days a week instead of six and long hours it's perfect for after work i can go home i can dive i can hang out so uh it, it's a real eye opener well that sounds like something we uh have to add to the list maybe uh, yeah. willie and the dive god and i plan a plan a trip to south korea wow that would be amazing i'm in, I'm in. okay all right and carl yeah, you'll lead, how, the, oh, no, lead the group i hope right oh be, be, <laughs> they have to <laughs> <laughs> <It was soft. laughs> okay. He's Surprised gonna, you, didn't I? He's going to plan accordingly to you know not be available at that time, but that's fine. <laughs> I wouldn't blame him either. But that's good stuff. So you can read the whole article. Uh, it's on page fifteen of Dive Industry uh, Magazine, Scuba Diving Industry Magazine. Yeah. So uh, uh, check that yeah. out. Good and, stuff, Carl. Yeah. And, and just a quick ad: if you do get over there, be sure to check out places like Coex Ball. Their whole approach to retailing is so heads and shoulders above the West that you can learn a lot just by walking around looking. Mm. Well, I just like the so sound of how he described it. So hopefully someone's listening right now, like, okay, let's add this to our dive shop. We'll come visit you there too. Good stuff. Good stuff indeed. All right. Next up, Alex Brilski, our good buddy. Uh, are you down in uh, Port St. Lucie right now, Alex? Is that where you are or what? Where are you? Actually, I'm in Avon Park, which is near oh. Sebring. Okay. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, page 31 is your latest article. Uh, you know, what is it and why should I care? Sustainability is what you're talking about. So what can you tell us? Indeed. Uh, what I try to do in the article is really make three key points. Uh, first, most people, I think, in our industry still look at the concept of sustainability as just altruism. 
you know, it's something nice to do for the environment or more likely they don't care at all. Uh, and the second point <laughs> based on that is that's a huge mistake because sustainability isn't just a bunch of kumbaya granola nonsense. It is a global societal megatrend that is affecting all markets and especially the younger end of the continuum, the, the Gen Zers and the millennials. And what I try to do in the article is present some data uh, from sources such as IBM's Institute for Business Value, Bookings.com, Expedia. Uh, I brought the people in from the ATTTA, the, the Adventure Travel Trade Association, uh, and the, the most recent, uh, in fact, the only data from the dive industry the survey that was done in 2022 from uh, the Reef World uh, Foundation to really demonstrate that if you don't, if you're not on board, you're going to be left behind because this is a critical issue to our survival, uh, and hence it's it's pretty chock full of, of data. Uh, but the the question I raise is just why has it taken so long for the dive industry to recognize this? Uh, the concept of, of sustainable development dates back to 1987 with the publication of something called the, the Brundtland Report. Uh, and business, many businesses have, have really jumped on it. Two examples I, I present in the article are two companies, Patagonia uh, and Osprey, the, the backpacking company. They have a, a wonderful explanation of their whole mission on their websites. And this is all linked to the uh, uh, the, the accompanying uh, material I have and showing you what companies who have really embraced this idea uh, have done and, and can do. And, and linking it to another concept I've talked a lot about in the past, and this is, you know, this, this mission, this ethos, really gets back to what Simon Sinek talks about in terms of the why of the business, of having a mission orientation. You just can't do, you know, uh, a, a beach cleanup once a year and expect that that's a commitment to sustainability, that this has to be part of the business ethos. And if that doesn't happen, it's not going to work. <clears throat> uh, the other point I try to make is that, uh, <laughs> and I, I can't really say this in a more polite way, the reason the dive industry is beginning to catch on is not because we have led. We are being dragged into this by consumers, because as I as I try to explain in the uh, uh, in the data, uh, this this is customer demand, and the younger the customer is, the more that demand is out there, and so that's kind of the the gist. Uh, it's also purposeful because uh, along with Catherine, actually, I'm going to be working with uh, Deep Blue Adventures, uh, and Cheryl Patterson has has put together a wonderful roundtable called Integrating Sustainability. And expanding your bottom line on Thursday. It's a pre it's a pre show uh, presentation, a roundtable actually with myself, with uh, Chloe uh, Harvey, with the Reef World Foundation, who who administer the Green Fins program. So, I'd like you to uh, like to see folks there, uh, and uh, I'll also be doing uh, doing a couple other seminars as well in the uh, uh, Deep Blue uh, seminar room. Love it, and so yeah, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, it's a good one. Uh, taboo. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, once again, he's another one of those folks. That if you're at the DEMA show and you have the opportunity to hear Alex speak and share all his knowledge, it's uh, quite a treat and something I'd highly uh, recommend as well. Good stuff as always, Alex. Thanks uh, for sharing. Thank you, guys. Uh, up next, Jeff, so, right? Am I so going before out we go to Jeff, okay. I think, yeah, no, no, you're doing just, just perfect. I just thought that Neil might want to comment on this next article because I think that's most of his dive locker. His uh, antiquated dive gear, old stuff. I, yeah, that's what uh, Jeff is going to speak <laughs> he, about. He, he said he had a double hose regulator donate to the museum down in Cayman. So I just thought that was kind of funny when I saw this article. You're going to love it, Neil. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and last time I, I did with Neil, he had a horse collar. Years it. Yeah, he's still <laughs> yeah, using exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, and I guess that's the. Uh, the point of the article on page 34, a uh, service department challenge, antiquated gear is what Jeff has uh, uh, written about. So let's just get right to it. So how do you deal with old stuff? And I don't mean Neil in particular. I mean his gear. <laughs> That's uh, you know, uh, what, what do you think, Jeff? What, well, what do you got for us? Well, you know, uh, 
these things just happen at the dive shop all the time. You know, we've got it, obviously a service department's a key component of the local dive shop or any dive center. And um, we have people coming in all the time. And I kind of bucket them into different categories. And, you know, we have our active divers and there are the conscientious people that bring in their stuff all the time. It's in good shape. It's clean. It's easy to work on. You know, you're not going to have any issues with it. But uh, then all of a sudden you get the not so uh, diligent diver bringing their gear in and uh, it's been dragged through the, the sand or it's not been well maintained. And we know we're going to have challenges with it. But that's that's just the active divers. A lot of times we have, um, you know, owners of antiquated dive gear come in and it's a challenge for us. Challenge for a number of reasons. One parts. They may still be making the service kits for those those regulators, but they're not making any of the spare parts. So if you take it apart and something breaks, it's not going to work anymore. So you got to be really careful about the parts. And then even if everything gets back put together again, it's old. The reliability of it, you can service a regulator, put it out there and who knows what's going to happen. We've seen it happen with BCs where they just, you know, everything checks out fine in the shop, uh, do the pressure test, everything, but then they take it out on a dive and something happens with it. And then finally, with the gear, you got to look at the liability aspect of it. Do you have the right uh, manuals for that? Do you have all the updated manuals for it? Some of these manufacturers require recertification or your techs recertified on it. So there's a lot of issues with that antiquated gear that you have to contend with. But uh, normally what will happen is a lot of times it'll be people that are non-divers bringing it in because they've discovered this in a basement or at a tag sale or something and they bring it in and they think it's very valuable. Uh, you have to educate them that, it's probably not, and they are willing to part with it. But then there are some of the divers who are re-engaging, and they've been out of the dive uh, diving for a while, and they bring all their old stuff in, and it's really a difficult discussion with them to say, you really should be upgrading your equipment. And sometimes they'll tell you, uh, well, this was top of the line. And yeah, it may have been, a long time ago, but it's not anymore. And you try to educate them. It's really hard that sometimes we've had to tell people, we're just not going to service your gear. And it's, you know, it's not a really good customer centric thing to do to sell, tell somebody you're not going to help them. But in the interest of safety and, uh, you know, making sure that they're safe, as well as keeping your business safe, you just have to let them walk out the door if they're not willing to upgrade. Right. You got to sell them on the idea like, hey, dude, you're diving with an iPhone 3. And there's a 16 out now. And uh, this deserves you know, uh, I, to be in a I museum in as opposed to in the water. I get maybe. in trouble because I ask them where they're buying their their tubes for their TV, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, I kidded Neil. He might have a year or two on the rest of us. And, uh, but, but, you know, some of the gear I've seen Neil has, I mean, yeah. I don't even know if they had writing back there for in, let alone in, manuals. In, in, the, in the early days, I had to have two sets of gear because dive shops would come dive with me with all of their students. And I was still diving with a four scholar BC and a wanted backpack and a J valve <laughs> right? and, uh, no octopus and whatever. And of course, they had sold all these kids all this new stuff, and they're asking their instructor, "Well, why do we have all this stuff?" Uh, and Neil's diving with that. Yeah. So <laughs> they said, "Neil, either upgrade and start diving with uh, real dive gear. We can't uh, bring our guests back." Yeah. So I, I still dove with my junk on my own, but I I, I wore the state of the art stuff when I had groups. Well, there you go. So N Neil holds a very distinctive record. Aside from holding like the world's deepest record, uh, the deepest dive on air in the Guinness Book of World Records and about a half a dozen other ones that are including breaking concrete with your head. So anyhow, uh, he also holds another distinction as one of the few dive operators that actually got the dive on their own dive boat wreck. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Yeah. Care to share? <laughs> Actually, I had a I had a dive shop. The owners from a dive shop in Daytona Beach, and and it was the two guys that owned the shop and their wives, <clears throat> and they came to Pivney on a fam trip to check out uh, if uh, they wanted to run groups, and we had like three days, and it was just spectacular. And the last day, we're doing this shallow dive, twenty feet of water. The seas are calm. And this was the days when, you know, I'd anchor the boat and I'd dive with the groups. And and we're swimming around and towards the end of the dive, I come to come up, come back to the anchor line. I start coming up the anchor line, coming up the anchor line. Thinking, boy, I don't remember leaving this much scope out. And then I see this shadow. It's my boat. Oops. It's on the bottom. It's like, <laughs> oh, this isn't good. No. So we came up, and of course, uh, fortunately, we were close to close to shore. Everybody swam to shore. The boat turned upside down when it sunk. Everybody's gear, uh, personal effects and stuff, was on the bottom. So I spent about three days, recovered everything. Um, I mean, everybody was safe. They had BCs, and we were we were not that far offshore. But actually, they didn't book a trip with me. Yeah. I don't understand. What? I don't know why. <laughs> really? They get a free wreck dive out of the deal. What do exactly. they want? Exactly. Well, yeah, Social recovery yeah, specialty. I, 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 I gave them a patty wreck diving uh, certificate. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> la, 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 Carl. I love it. So uh, <laughs> our next our next uh, contributor, I have to think, um, this is the third in a three-part series they've, they've written for us. And uh, uh, in our... Last issue, we had an article about the Olympics and how that some divers uh, um, with Naui were involved in placing all the cameras. And it was certainly it 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 vied for our top spot last month between that and the previous second version of this series, which is how to sell your dive business. That's how much interest there is in the marketplace out there for um, trying to retire or do something different. So um, go ahead, Greg. I'll you. Enter. Well, Jessica, welcome once again. So page 22. And the latest uh, in this uh, scuba diving industry magazine is uh, communicating a change in ownership. So give us a few tips from your experience that works best. What can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So we lay out four tips in the article, but I'll give you sort of the pre-tip before we even get to those. And that's really all about confidentiality. Obviously, any change in ownership and selling a dive business that you've worked on for years and years or decades and decades is a really sensitive topic. Um, and so keeping that during the process, or maybe hopefully it was helpful with our other articles, if you're just looking at what's next, or if you are working through a deal, keeping that really close to the vest um, until a deal is finalized, because it can be sensitive, of course, to you, but to your employees, to your staff, and to your pros as well. Um, so really keeping that close. But then once you have a deal and it's finalized, really working on that communication plan and there's sort of four pieces that we list out in the article. You know, the first is sharing your why, just being really honest and authentic, talking about what brought you to this decision, why you chose the new owner. And there's what you say, but there's how you say it. There's the nonverbal cues and everything that goes into that because the communication of that message and what's next in your legacy is so important. So first one, just sharing your why, being really honest in what led you to the decision. Um, the second one is considering your audiences, and this is true in really any big announcement that you might have, even if it's not a change in ownership. Um, different people are going to feel differently, and thinking about the questions you're going to get from your dive pros versus your staff, your retail staff, even your vendors and your partners that have been supporting the store for so long, just thinking about each of those differently. I use FAQ sheets all the time. How can you have a different FAQ sheet for each of those and know Here's what my dive pros, I, I know it's going to be the first burning question that they ask me. And that's going to look a little different than the retail associates that are in the store, you know, every day um, or who have manned the shop for you for a really long time. The third is just acknowledging that change is inevitable. We all know that the world is always changing. Um, but we've been guilty of this ourselves. Sometimes in a big change, you want to say it's going to be easy. There's not that much to change. And so my third tip is really just don't sugarcoat it from the beginning. Be honest about the change, um, be upfront, even embrace it. Use that moment to really capture what is going to change and just lay it out. It's better to do it in the upfront than to say nothing's going to change and have to recap or, you know, share more about those changes later. 
Uh, and then the fourth is just offering different ways to engage. Um, you know, where we have seen success in the past is really that face-to-face -face communication. So after a deal is done and we've closed a deal, really going in person, getting to sit with the ownership, you know, with the team that is going to stay on board, talk to the pros one-to-one -to -one or the trip leaders, and then have a customer event. Let them ask questions of us as DiVentures or if it's a different um, new seller coming in or new buyer coming in, let them, the customers be able to ask questions directly and just keep that open, keep it a two-way or it might be a three-way street uh, at that point, but keep the communication open, allow for that dialogue uh, and be able to answer those questions. So those are really our four tips and certainly important if you are selling or, or looking at a change in ownership, but hopefully those are helpful with any big announcement in a dive shop as well. Yeah, well, I, I, it's good stuff. And you know, if you're the owner and you're selling, I mean, the what, step five is where's the first place you're going to go once you've uh, sold the business and you can bring some of your you know best customers with you, you know, that kind of thing. You might have you can put your head around that one, too. But it's good stuff. And Dive Ventures, you know, they, they run an amazing operation. So if you find yourself in that situation with your dive shop, you definitely need to talk to them and uh, pick their brain at the bare minimum. And that's uh, well, you'd help them with that. Right, Jessica? Yeah. Absolutely. Good stuff. Good stuff indeed. All right. So we, we finally have gotten back to uh, Samantha. Finally, Whit Samantha. Whitcraft. Uh, and I'm going to say it right Got once. It right. Once. Uh, you know, and, and I apologize for doing it earlier, but we're getting close to Halloween. So what do you want from me? But, uh, but uh, Samantha, thank you for uh, uh, standing by page 23. See a change nonprofit. That's what you're involved with. Uh, page 23 in the latest uh, edition of scuba diving industry magazine tell us about some of the latest sea of change projects that you're involved with happy to yeah. and don't worry about the name it's one of those ones that's hard to remember but impossible to forget so there it's you fine. go absolutely yeah. absolutely um, okay so the sea of change foundation the title of the article and thank you for the opportunity to put the article in your wonderful magazine i appreciate that um Our it's, pleasure. it's a good opportunity to get the word out about a, what obviously i'm a bias a little bit but a really great foundation and the reason i think the foundation um is worthy of people's attention and involvement in is because um, we're small but mighty. So uh, we were founded by leaders in the dive and adventure travel industries. And so that um, influenced our mission statement, um, which is that um, we want to create positive change for the natural world that we all love to enjoy and explore. Um, so what that tells you uh, is that the kinds of projects, unique community-based projects that we find to fund, I'm pretty sure would speak to um, that audience that loves to be either underwater or over the water or on the coast or in the mountains and wants those things that they love and appreciate to be protected. Um, the other thing that's amazing about the foundation, and I've worked in the marine conservation nonprofit field or marine science field for 30 years now. And this is the first um, nonprofit that I've worked with where 100% of all the funds raised goes to conservation. There is no overhead. There is no admin. Um, all of those costs are covered by our partner at Aggressor Adventures. Um, so that's really, really powerful and, and really important. So I didn't want to bury that lead. Um, we have three focus areas, again, small but mighty, right? So we don't have deep pockets, but we're able to get the best bang for our buck in terms of conservation by being really focused, not just on our mission statement, but what we hone in on. So those successful grants that we fund each year have to fall into one of the three focus areas for the foundation. The first is coral reefs, restoration and resilience. So the days of putting a dotted line on a map around a reef, it's not going to do it anymore. So restoration and resilience is key. Ocean pollution, public awareness and action. Um, and then the final and one dearest to my heart is projects that address threatened species and habitats. Um, so some examples of those um, that we have either finished up or that we're in the middle of funding or guiding or advising on 
is a we funded project Seahorse to analyze diver citizen science collected data about sightings of seahorses in different places all around the world. And those data were peer reviewed and published. And many of those species had not been fully described in the regions where the divers were able to collect that data. Um, also, we funded uh, the Sri Lankan Wildlife Conservation Society, because again, we're terrestrial and marine, not just marine, um, to fund a, an amazing project called uh, Project Orange Elephant. And so we funded uh, the distribution of 2,500 orange tree saplings to be planted by um, local farmers. And the reason that's a conservation action is because um, these farmers are looking for crops that they can bring to the market and make money uh, or eat themselves, but um, many of the crops are stolen by elephants because they're also looking for food in those habitats. But the wonderful thing is that elephants don't like oranges. They avoid all citrus. They're just not a fan. So when these local farmers plant these orange trees, they get a natural deterrent from foraging elephants, which keeps the elephants safe. And it also gives the farmers a cash crop. So uh, we also funded with that project um, planting toolkits and four irrigation systems. So that was wonderful. We funded Reef Renewal Curacao um, to fragment 1,500 pieces of endangered corals, like pillar corals and star corals, to expand their nursery for species that are now being in, impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease. And um, another project that's very close and dear to my heart because I've been able to be involved with guiding it is we work with the Science Exchange um, International Sea Turtle Internship Program in Mexico. And two projects we've done with them is we funded a competition for um, school children to design a better box for sea turtle nests, because I don't know if you've been to sea turtle nesting beaches, but the default is styrofoam coolers for the, for the nest reclamation. The problem is styrofoam coolers, styrofoam coolers only last one season, and then they break apart, and then those styrofoam beads can end up in the ocean, and then sea turtle hatchlings eat the styrofoam. Like, it's just, it, for all the years I've worked in sea turtle conservation, I could never understand the styrofoam coolers. So um, we had two winning uh, designs that were made from local products, and uh, we're working on getting a permit to test those on actual eggs. The data that we collected was using loggers to show that they were safe for the eggs. And then we uh, trained local students in how to, from local vines, uh, make uh, light shields for restaurants along the beaches. And if they participated in the program, they got these beautiful handwoven light shields that were made by the local students and yellow bulbs instead of white bulbs. And doing that, we've been able with the local communities in that part of the Pacific coast of Mexico to greatly reduce um, the light pollution on the beaches, which is so important for the success of not only nesting, but also hatchlings. And then finally, um, Oh, no, there's two more. We were thrilled to be able to fund a graduate student from Arizona State University working on the island of Trinidad at Grand Riv Riviere Beach, which is the largest leatherback nesting and densest nesting beach in the Caribbean. Leatherbacks are critically endangered now. And that beach, I was lucky enough to go there, oh, God, maybe two decades ago now, and saw my first nesting leatherback and was amazed at the time to find out that while there are community groups working to protect that beach, there was very little comprehensive data looking at density dependence and questions central to conservation management of that beach. So we have funded that first project starting to comprehensively collect those data. And then we also funded the Right Whale Sighting Network right here in Florida to create signage at Atlantic Coast beaches letting the community know that um, these whales are so endangered. They're called the right whale because during whaling, they were considered the right whale to kill. And those populations never fully rebounded from that intensive whaling. And now the remnant population of the Atlantic is subject to a lot of vessel strikes. So these sightings that people have from the beaches are incredibly important to report to the right whale sighting network so that they can work with um, 
their partners in the shipping industry to avoid the areas where the right whales, moms and calves have been sighted. So we funded that signage project, which is putting signs up along those coasts, starting, I think, at Sebastian Beach. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just some of the, so we find projects that with a, with a little bit of seed money, our mean grant, our median grant is about $12,000. So even with a little bit of money directed in the right place with the right community work, we can really positively move the needle. And I want to remind people that, of course, we're always seeking donations. We're having a big auction, our big yearly auction in November. So you'll be hearing about that at DEMA. I'll be at the aggressor booth. Come say hi. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's our big fundraiser. But we're always looking for donations. And if you want to donate to an organization that I know for a fact is moving the needle in meaningful ways in conservation and where 100% of your donation goes to those meaningful projects, then I encourage you to check out the Sea of Change Foundation. And the Thank website you. is what, Samantha? www.seaofchange.com, not .org, because we would have had to pay extra for that, and that's money that could have gone to conservation. So it's www.seaofchange.com. And stuff. there's one more piece yeah. of news that we need to say. Dan Orr is receiving the Lifetime Explorer Award from Sea of Change at DEMA this year, correct? How about that? That's right. I wasn't going to spill the beans, but I'm proud to say that, Dan, you are our winner this year, well-deserved, and we will be plying you and as many people as want to show up at the Aggressor booth Thursday for the last hour of the show to give you your award, celebrate you, and drink some beer and wine. You heard it first here on Level Up Podcast. <laughs> so I want to. We need to move along a little quickly here. We got one more speaker to go, one more contributor, and I'm going to set the tone here. Um, many of you might not know, but I wear two hats here. Um, aside from publish the magazine, uh, I also am the executive director of the Cayman Islands uh, International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame, and where there's a museum down in Cayman, and, and we do a big ceremony, which just happened this last weekend, and. Dan was gracious enough to come down and be the keynote that I mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast. It was so amazing. But our On the Beach reporter that covered the event is our very own Amber Wagonette, and she is going to give us kind of an overview. Uh, Greg, I'll let you do the intro there. Yes. Well, Amber, welcome. So, uh, yeah, tell us how the Hall of Fame event went there in the Caymans. What can you tell us? You know, I, I got to say, there's probably only one thing that would have been that would have made it a little bit better than Willie Klein and Dan Orr in a tux, and that would have been <laughs> Neil Watson in a tux. Or, or a mermaid tail, I but agree. that's a yeah. totally different. Yeah. You missed that, Amber. That was earlier. <laughs> but, uh, next year. Yeah, it was next fabulous. Year. Yeah. You know, <laughs> your writers talk a lot about diving being part of a tribe, right? And that week in Grand Cayman was such a week of being part of a tribe, being surrounded by a group of people that, all walks of life, all across the globe, all passionate about one thing. And that, you know, the one thing we call scuba. So it, it wasn't just about individual accomplishments of what the four royalty um, in the international inductees, Claudio, John, Enric, and Margo, um, but also their just collaborative spirit. And I gotta tell you, Margo's thank you. If we have Margo's thank you speech on um tape somewhere it just brought me to tears and the 8000 kids that she has um she's certified i mean it was it was amazing and there was you know nothing that a little helene we couldn't have just pushed off to the side and, and celebrated it was a wonderful wonderful event and the local leadership of grand cayman the minister of tourism and ports and that whole staff and the whole group of people man they they put on a really good party no and, doubt. and, you know, what's what was cool is that we had this room full of people from literally across the planet and all different levels within the industry. And there was one common tie in. Everybody was passionate about diving and you could see it. You could feel it. And we're talking to the top of the government, to the person that received the emerging award that has a water sports boat operator. It all was there. And uh, come next year. It's really worth it. Right, Amber? It is worth it. And if, if you see the photos in the magazine, especially of the statue, it's made by a local artisan using Caymanite. And it weighed, what, 35 pounds? Wow. Very impressive. What was the statue of? 
It's um, it's a block of caimanite with a diver on the side, and then there are stingrays that are at the top of it. From Stingray oh, City. Go, Willie. Yeah. There, there, yeah. If you look at my right. finger yeah. right there, more there. or less, you can oh, see it. Oh, okay, there you go. So yeah. look, look in the magazine. It's in the magazine right. of Scuba Diving and Industry also, Magazine. Right. We also went out to Page to 40. We're going to have what, Dan? Say, say it again. I also went out and talked to the local school. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Yes, you got to hang out with a local high school. And there it is. And... Neil, Neil's got it right there. Oh, exactly. And he has his own little statue. There it is. Neil, Neil there has you it. Go. So Patty is going to talk a little bit, just for a couple of seconds, about the school thing, because it really was significant. Patty, what can you tell us? I can tell you it was very impressive. Um, first of all, having never been to Grand Cayman, and then to go to their local school, and it was a public school, the facility was beautiful. The principal is a former dive master. Um, and so he was very passionate too about diving. They actually integrate scuba diving into their curriculum through their science programs. They have PE students that are becoming divers. Um, they've got a couple of kids that are ambassadors for the island that travel on behalf of Cayman Islands um, to encourage uh, you know, conservation and the island itself. So uh, Dan and John Tett um, were the presenters for a careers in diving assembly, and they invited about 150 high school students to attend. It was um, inspirational. The kids just were on the edge of their seats through the entire presentation, um, listening intently, laughing at a lot of the things that Dan especially had in his presentation, that uh, seeing the big fish and ooing and aahing, seeing his photographs even of wildlife other than sea life that he's taken. Um, they were so fascinating. And then at the end, they allowed uh, the kids to do a Q&A and the hands were up. They were surrounding these guys at the end when they were, uh, of course, were they trying to stay out of class? We just don't know. Mm -hmm. But they all hung out afterward and just surrounded them, asking them more and more questions. And Dan can speak to what they were asking because I wasn't up close to see that. But um, really neat. And next year, uh, the plan is to go to more schools uh, due to the weather. Some of them were canceled. So it'll be really neat to see how they integrate the locals into um, the diving part of it and the uh, International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame. So I would say it was a great success, but Dan can speak to what they talked to him about. I mean, they were asking a lot of really good questions. They were asking about the environment, how divers can contribute to the health of the environment. They were asking about uh, career paths and diving. Uh, so the questions were all really, really good. Excellent. Well, good stuff. I mean, uh, Willie, I mean, there, that, that's a lot of stuff in the uh, September issue of Scuba Diving it Industry sure Magazine. My gosh. It sure is. And thank you, everybody. And I want to tell a little commercial for next month is our big DEMA issue. So we're going to have uh, everything DEMA. We've got, uh, we're going to have an exhibitor list in there. We're going to have some seminar lists. Um, it's going to be everything relevant to the DEMA show. And it will be distributed actually at the show, in addition to mail to all the dive shops, of course, before uh, we get to the show. So, uh that's going to be a wrap, I think, uh, Greg. Yeah, for the September issue of Level Up, uh, I think that'll do. Uh, Till next time, uh, don't I forget. I want to jump in and say one what? thing as a, parting, as, yes. a, as a parting encouragement. Yeah. We are, divers are beautiful people that love helping others. And if you have not already made some form of contribution to the Hurricane Helene effort, I encourage you to find whatever way that you can do your bit to help those from Florida on up because it's going to take a long time to recover. And as a personal hurricane survivor of many storms and one loss, one big loss in 1995, I know it takes a long while and it takes a lot of initiative from everybody who can help. So. Thank you. Um, if you point. haven't done that, do it now. See, there's that beautiful spirit I was tell, uh, telling everybody Wonderful. about earlier. Catherine Castle, she's she's the gal. All right. Well, on that uplifting note, we're going to wrap it up uh, till next month. Uh, you know, don't forget to check out Scuba Radio every Saturday, 3 to 5 Eastern time. I am Greg the Dime Master. Till then, remember, Bye, it is always better 
down where down it's where wetter. It's wetter. <laughs> this has been Level Up, the podcast of Scuba Diving Industry Magazine. Produced by Scuba Radio and the Klein Group. For more info, go to scuba